um, to Florence in Tuscany. Uh, as usual, before we start the class, I would like to take a few moments, uh, a mindful moment to breathe in and try to relax our bodies. So if you can, if, if you want, you can close your eyes and relax your body. Uh, try to feel uh, the earth with your feet and breathe in through your nose and out of your mouth. Be aware of your body and everything that surrounds you. And be present in the moment. When you're ready, you can open your eyes and we can um, start with the class. Uh, as I mentioned, we are going to see Florence today, Firenze, which is the heart of Renaissance. And I'm going to start with this uh, introductory video. Uh, to I could watch this video forever. Firenze, I consider Firenze a little bit my city because I grew up only uh, like 30 minutes uh, ride drive from, from Firenze. It was our place to go on weekends. And also when we were like secretly skipping school with my high school friends, Firenze was the place to go for us. Um, so let's see together. Uh, Firenze is a city in this central in central Italy. It is the capital city of Tuscany, uh, the Tuscany region, and it is uh, the most populated city in Tuscany. Uh, the historical center has about four hundred thousand inhabitants, and with uh, the metropolitan area, it reaches one point five uh, million. Um, the name Firenze derives from Latin Florencia and from the verb florere, which means blossoming. Um, it is possible then um, uh, the name derives from the Roman games that were called Ludi Florealis. They were games organized by Romans uh, that the Romans used to play to welcome the spring season. And that's why uh, there's a flower. Uh, the, the Gio, which is uh, the, the flower that you see in red in this slide, uh, is the symbol of the city since the 11th century. Uh, it's not really a lily. The, transla the translation from Italian to English would be lily, but this is really uh, an iris. It's more, more uh, an iris florentina, which is the one that you see in the uh, picture on the right uh, corner. Um, the Etruscans were the ancient inhabitants of this area uh, of Tuscany and part of Umbria and Lazio as well. They were already in this area uh, in the 8th century BC, but uh, the present uh, Floren uh, Firenze, the, pre the present city of Firenze, was established by Giulio uh, Cesare himself in 59 BC as a settlement for his veteran soldiers. And it was originally named Florencia, as we mentioned already. Uh, because it was um, um, an army camp, uh, the city had uh, the two main perpendicular roads called Cardo and Decumano that you can see in the picture on the on the upper right corner, uh, intersecting in what is today Piazza della Repubblica, Republic uh, Square. Uh, the city was under the Roman Empire and over the centuries experienced a turbulent period, especially uh, after the German barbaric invasions, when it was conquered by the Ostrogoth first and then by the Lombard in the sixth century. In 1774, Firenze was conquered by Charlemagne and became part of the Duchy of Tuscany, which at that time had uh, the city of Lucca as a capital. Uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, in 1100s, Firenze was a city-state, what it's called in Italian, a comune, which is basically 
uh, like a modern township, uh, the primary resources for Firenze at the time were uh, the river Arno, uh, which was providing power and access to the city and the trade route into the Mediterranean Sea um, uh, for the international trade, of course. The city became uh, the principal center of continental Tuscany. Uh, at that time with a population of over uh, 30,000 people. Mm -hmm. um, Firenze, unfortunately, was devastated as many other cities we saw already for, for Venezia by the Black Plague in 1348. Uh, it seems like the plague at that time reduced the population by over half, which is, which is a, a, big, a big number. Um, textile industry and later banking uh, we'll see, especially with the Medici family, where uh, the two main activities in the city. Um, about one quarter of the population work uh, at the time in the city's wool industry. Merchants began to organize themselves in corporate association around uh, 1182. And the population continued to grow, especially because of immigrants coming from the countryside. Uh, in 1378, uh, the wool workers uh, called Chompi organized themselves in a brief revolt against the government. And the revolt is known as the revolt of Chompi. After the revolt, Firenze was under the Albizzi family. Uh, this is the end of the 1300s and the Albizzi uh, became uh, bitter rivals of the Medici family. But to fully understand how uh, the, the city was working during uh, this time, we need to talk briefly about the guilds in Florence. Uh, the guilds were corporations that controlled the arts and the trade in the city between 12th and 16th century. Uh, there were major, middle, and minor guilds. Uh, between the major guilds, we had the wool workers, the silk, uh, merchants, and physicians, and pharmacists, and of course, bankers and lawyers as well. The middle guilds were mostly butchers and blacksmiths and shoemakers. And then we had nine minor guilds. Uh, amongst them, uh, there were the merchants of olive oil, uh, locksmith and uh, wine dealers as well. These guilds were basically controlling the political life and they were the reason why Firenze became during this time one of the richest city, uh, not only in Italy, but, but in, in Europe. Uh, the popolo minuto, um, the skilled workers were not allowed to enter any of the guilds. Uh, and the first guild in Florence uh, was the Arte of Calimala, which was the Cloth Merchants Guild that is mentioned already in a document dated 1150. Uh, so to enter a guild, it was necessary to be a legitimate son, of course, the male, not the female, of a member uh, of the guild. And uh, you, you were supposed to pay an entry fee. Uh, the master took an apprentice to learn the secrets and work until he could become a master himself. Uh, six of the priori of the Signoria di Firenze were selected from the major guilds and two uh, from the minors. Um, so um, to fully understand uh, the dynamics in Florence around this time, we need to learn a little bit about the Medici family, uh, who, as I mentioned, were uh, part of, the, they were bankers. So they were part of the major guild in Florence. Uh, um, so the Medici was uh, an Italian banking family that became also a political dynasty starting in the 15th century. The Medici Bank was the largest in Europe during the 15th century uh, and surpassed uh, the Bank of Siena, 
which before was the leading bank in, in center Italy and, until the rise of the Medici. Um, the Medici were able to connect to uh, most others, um, other elite families in Europe with marriage of convenience. And this is also one of the reason uh, for the rise of this powerful family. The Medici Bank was created by Giovanni di Bici de Medici, but it was with uh, Cosimo, Piero, and Lorenzo that the family was able to rule the city for over 100 years and become really, really powerful. Uh, keep in mind that the Medici family produced also four, of, uh, four popes of the uh, Catholic Church. Leone X, Clemente VII, Pio IV, and Leone XI, and also two queens, Caterina de' Medici and Maria de' Medici. Uh, Caterina married uh, King Henry II, and Maria uh, was the second wife of Henry uh, IV of France. Um, so the Medici family uh, uh, also were patrons of the major artists uh, working in the city at the time, like uh, uh, such as Brunelleschi, Botticelli, Leonardo da Vinci, and later Michelangelo and Raffaello, and also um, a famous scientist like Galileo Galilei. Uh, in these three pictures that I put in this slide, you can see on the top right corner, Eleonora de' Medici with her son uh, Giovanni by Bronzino. It's a beautiful portrait. And then on the left, you have Ghirlandaio with the portrait of Piero de' Medici. And on the bottom uh, right corner, you see uh, the portrait of Giuliano de' Medici by Botticelli. Uh, let's watch together a, br a brief video about this very powerful family. Um, so when we mention Florence, um, it always comes up, the definition of being the heart of Renaissance. But so what was really Renaissance? Um, Renaissance is, was a cultural movement that profoundly affected not only Italy, but Europe in general. Uh, the word Renaissance comes from French and it means uh, rebirth. Uh, and it really represents the rebirth of the modern world as we know it. Um, there's, this, there's this substantial change uh, between uh, Middle Ages and Renaissance. So now God, it's no longer the only center of the universe, but his creation, man, is now the focal point. So the best way to celebrate God is to use the talents that God gives us. And this is uh, a, philo a philosophy uh, that is called humanism. And the Renaissance scholars were mostly interested in re recovering and studying ancient uh, literary texts uh, from uh, Latin and Greek culture. So authors uh, such as Cicerone, Livio and Virgilio were rediscovered and brought back into the Western European culture. Uh, in architecture, we see this very balanced uh, buildings with domes and columns and arches that were typical of the ancient world. In painting, we see realism uh, taking over symbolism that was typical of the Middle Ages, and we see uh, human emotions coming through. Uh, in general, man moves from under the shadow of the church and express an optimism and confidence on the new age. And he relies uh, more than ever on science. Think about uh, all the mathematical rules that are applied in art during this time. Uh, first, uh, the linear perspective that was born with, with this movement um, in Italy. So we see in general an explosion of innovation and families like the Medici 
showing their civic pride, commissioning uh, splendid arts, uh, art to these uh, very creative artists that they, that they were living in town, in the city. Um, um, for many uh, scholars, uh, Renaissance was born in Florence in late uh, 14th century uh, with the writing of Dante Alighieri, uh, in particular with uh, the divine comedy that Dante wrote. Um, so Dante Alighieri was a poet, a writer, and also a political activist. He was born in 1265 in Florence. Um, he, and he, the Divine Comedy, it's his masterpiece. And uh, it's a very long poem uh, that Dante began to write in 1308 and complete writing in 1320. It is considered one of the greatest works, not only of Italian literature, but of literature uh, worldwide. The poem is an imaginative spiritual journey of the author, Dante Alighieri, through uh, hell, purgatory, and heaven, and it represents basically the soul's journey uh, towards uh, God. Uh, the afterlife that Dante presents is typical of the Middle Ages, um, uh, but the big change here is that Dante, for the first time, doesn't use Latin to write uh, the Divine Comedy, but he uses uh, Tuscan language. Uh, and it is from this Tuscan language that the modern Italian uh, developed. So this is, this is really important uh, for, for Italian uh, literature. The poem is composed of 14,233 lines. Numbers are really important in this, in this poem. Uh, so these uh, lines are divided into three sections uh, called cantiche, and each cantica consists of 33 cantos. As, as you see, number three is prominent in this work because it's the number of the Trinity in Catholic Church, is the number of perfection of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, the poem um, begins on the night before Good Friday in uh, the year 1300. Dante at the time is 35 years old, so he's in the middle of his life, and he's lost in this dark wood when he met uh, Virgilio, Virgil, who becomes his guide through his journey in uh, Inferno, Hell, and Purgatory. Um, so the, uh, the beginning of the poem, it's very famous in the in midway upon the journey of our life, because as I mentioned, he's 35 years old at the time. I found myself within a forest dark for the straightforward pathway had been lost. Um, so allegorically, the inferno represents the Christian soul seen, uh, scenes for what really is. So in the inferno, we have all the sinners, uh, Dante put in the inferno, all the sinners. In a purgatory, um, there's people who use love in an improper way. Um, and then in, Parad in Paradiso, in, in and paradise or heaven, uh, Dante is able to finally see God. Uh, he cannot express this view with words, but he's finally understanding the mystery of uh, Christ as a divinity and as a human as well. Um, so in Paradiso, Dante has another guide, uh, his, uh, his muse, his love, uh, Beatrice, uh, guide, guides him through uh, all the cardinal virtues. Um, so after these parentheses, I want to go back to the history of the city on uh, more modern and recent times. In 1532, uh, the Medici became uh, Dukes of Florence, and in 1569, they became Grand Dukes of Tuscany. Um, in 18th and 19th century, with the extinction of the Medici dynasty, uh, Tuscany was included briefly under the Austrian crown. Between uh, 1801 and 1807, Firenze was the capital of the Napoleonic Kingdom of Etruria. 
in 807 Tuscany was under France until the fall of Napoleon in 1814. In 1861, uh, Tuscany became a region of the Kingdom of Italy. And in 1865, Firenze became the capital of Italy after Turin and just before Rome, who became capital, uh, which became capital in 1871. During the Second World War, the city experienced one year of German occupation, uh, 1943 to 44. And unfortunately, when the Germans were retreating, they decided to demolish all the bridges along the river Arno. Luckily, they decided to spare Ponte Vecchio. And I'm gonna tell you when, we're gonna talk about Ponte Vecchio next class. And I'm gonna tell you there's a, there's a nice story around it. Uh, Firenze was liberated on August 4th, 1944. In more recent time, uh, Firenze uh, in 1966 was devastated by a terrible flood from the river Arno. Um, it was November 4th, 1966. I don't know if you remember um, like reading or like watching videos about this, um, uh, this terrible flood. This was the the worst flood that the city in the city history. There was one back in 1333, but this one was was devastating for for the city. Uh, the highest flows of the River Arno are generally uh, between in spring or in fall um, every year. So November, it's a scary month for uh, many cities in Italy. Uh, on November 4th, 1966, after a very long period of steady rain, the dams of the uh, of two towns, uh, Levane, which is my, my hometown, and La Penna, uh, they're both towns in the valley of the river Arno, began to discharge uh, an impressive a quantity of water um, um, and um, towards Florence. And around 4 a.m., the engineers of the two dams, uh, they were afraid that the dams would burst. And so they opened the dams. And so this massive quantity of water reached Florence um, at a speed of 60 kilometers per hour. Uh, as you can see from this picture, uh, from this scary picture, at 9.30 a.m., Piazza del Duomo, where the cathedral, uh, the baptistery, and the Giotto's bell towers are, was completely flooded. At its highest, the water reached over six meters in the Santa Croce area. Um, the flood, of course, had a major impact on economic and cultural life in Firenze. Uh, there were no really emergency measures in place because, as I mentioned, um, the last big flood in the city was dated back to the 1333, so there was no memory of anything uh, that bad, so there were no measures in place. So unfortunately, over 100 people died that day. Uh, over 5,000 families were left without a home, and uh, there were serious damages to uh, artworks in general, three to four million books and original manuscripts were damaged, as well as 14,000 14, artworks, uh, amongst them uh, more than 1,000 went completely lost. Uh, the, um, the symbol of the flood uh, in terms of artwork is uh, uh, the crucifix by uh, Cimabue that I'm sure you saw in, in many videos and uh, articles related to this terrible flood. But um, something beautiful also came from this terrible flood. Uh, volunteers from all over the world, uh, this country included, um, mostly college students arrived to Florence to save what they could. Because they were working constantly on mud, they were called uh, the Mad Angels, gli Angeli del Fango. Um, and they came to Florence knowing that Firenze doesn't belong to Tuscany, doesn't belong to Italy, but Firenze belongs to the world. 
And so they help in every possible way. Uh, and um, new techniques were also uh, created during this time from uh, the main Italian uh, institution for conservation. Um, the one in Florence is the Opificio delle Pietre Dure. Um, and thanks to the Opificio uh, was invented the technique where you detach the fresco from the wall. It, it, it's dated back uh, to this, to this um, uh, dark time of the history of the city. Uh, there's also a movie that I never watched, but it's a, a movie by Zeffirelli. It's about the flood and it's called Florence Days of Destruction and it's with Richard Barnes if you have the chance, if you want to learn more. Um, so now I'm going to show you um, um, a slideshow with original black and white pictures of the aftermath of this terrible flood, where you will see these um, mud angels trying to save uh, what they go um, to do it. Um, so um, right now we're going to start to see some of the main sites of the city. Of course, uh, I can't possibly do everything because there's like so many things to see and, and talk about. Uh, so I'm going to focus mostly on the Piazza del Duomo, where you see the beautiful Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore with the Baptistery and the Giotto Bells Tower. And then I'm going to do uh, the Palazzo Vecchio or Della Signoria. And we're going to walk together inside the uh, corridor uh, uh, by Vasari, the Corridoio Vasariano, that uh, connects Palazzo Vecchio to Palazzo Pitti. So we're going to go through the corridor visiting the Uffizi Gallery. Uh, we're going to talk about Ponte Vecchio, and then we'll end in Boboli's Garden and the Palazzo Pitti. Um, all right, so we are going to start with the Battistero, Battistery, uh, also known as Battistery of St. John, is a religious building across the Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore. It's one of the oldest buildings in the city, was uh, constructed between 1059 and 1128. At that time, I think this is a mostly an Italian tradition, you could not enter the church if you were not baptized. And this is the reason why the building is separated from the cathedral. Uh, the octagonal shape, however, was very common for baptisteries for many centuries. Uh, the Battistery is famous for this uh, Romanesque style of these uh, polychrome marbles that you see in the facade, but it's mostly famous for the three sets of bronze doors with relief sculptures. Uh, Andrea Pisano designed the first set in 1329, and then in 1401, uh, Lorenzo Ghiberti won a competition to design the doors uh, for the north side. Uh, in this competition, finalists from the same competition were Brunelleschi, Donatello, and Jacopo della Quercia. It took 21 years for Ghiberti to complete these doors, also because he was using a very particular technique to gild the bronze, he was using mercury. So a very dangerous chemical as we know now, but they didn't know at the time. In 1424, Ghiberti received a second commission for uh, additional doors in the east side of the baptistery. Michelangelo uh, referred to this door as feet to be the gates of paradise. And from that moment on, this is the name that the doors are known uh, by. The doors you see now are copies of the, and the originals were moved in 1990 inside the Museum of the Opera del Duomo where they were recently restored by the Opificio, which is the, uh, the uh, Conservation Institute in Florence. It took over 20 years to uh, restore the doors because of, as I mentioned, of the particular technique of Ghiberti using the mercury uh, and for other reasons like uh, 
uh, the, uh, at one point they run out of funds. Uh, so it took literally 20 years uh, to restore these beautiful doors. Uh, the baptistery is crowned with magnificent mosaic ceilings. Uh, works on mosaic started in 1225. Uh, they were made by a Franciscan friar, Jacopo Torriti. There's an inscription inside the baptistery, so thanks to that we know the name of the artist. As you can see from the mosaics, uh, uh, Jacopo Torriti was trained in Venezia and was strongly influenced by Byzantine art. Um, a curiosity is that Dante Alighieri and Giotto were both baptized in, in this baptistery. Next to the baptistery in the same piazza, in the same square, we have the Giotto's uh, bell tower, Campanile, which is a freestanding bell tower uh, next also to the Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore. Uh, the tower is uh, in Florentine Gothic style, it was designed by Giotto himself. Uh, Giotto was in fact nominated a successor of Arnolfo di Cambio when he died in 1334. But at that time Giotto was already uh, old, he was 67 and at that time was considered already pretty old. And the first stone of the baptistery was laid, in, I'm sorry, of the uh, bell tower was laid in 1334 and the tower was finished much later in 1359. It's uh, uh, 278 feet tall. Um, Giotto died only after three years uh, in 1337. Uh, so he was only able to finish the lower uh, level of the tower with marbles and reliefs in, in these hexagonal panels. Giotto was succeeded by Andrea Pisano in 1343. So the hexagonal panels that you see in the big picture on the left um, depict the story of mankind uh, from the Genesis. Uh, some of these panels are from Giotto, others are from Andrea Pisano. Pisano is completely responsible for the second level of the, of the tower with the statue of the prophets. And then the three top levels were built by Francesco Talenti. Uh, speaking about mathematical rules applied to architecture, uh, the, uh, the tower was built with a trick. Uh, so each level, each, each level is larger than the lower level. So if you, if you look at the tower from the bottom, it seems like the tower is exactly equal in size. And that's what um, uh, the architect uh, uh, of, the, of the tower were able to do using mathematical um, rules. Next to the tower, to the Campanile, we have the uh, beautiful, um, iconic uh, cathedral of Firenze, uh, Santa Maria del Fiore, which is a, a Catholic church. Uh, it was begun in 1296, is in Gothic style, and it's uh, the first design by Arnolfo di Cambio, and that was completed much later in 1436, so it required almost two centuries to finish the church with the uh, famous dome by Brunelleschi. The cathedral was built on the side on the side of Florence, a uh, cathedral dedicated to Santa Reparata, which is the ancient structure of the church, which is uh, dated back to the uh, fifth century. Uh, the main idea was to build a huge cathedral uh, to show uh, all the appreciation to God, but to also show the power of the city of Florence. The, cath the cathedral was um, was, was going to be built to feed 100,000 people. They fell short on this goal, but uh, it looks like in the cathedral you can feed 3,000 people, which is a humongous number. Uh, and they, they, were ma they managed to create the ext extraordinary uh, building. When Arnolfo di Cambio died in 1302, Giotto was appointed to oversee uh, the works assisted by Andrea Pisano. 
uh, and uh, there was a stop at the building of the church in 1337 when Giotto died. And then again in 1348, because of the uh, Black Plague uh, works, stop again. A very important date uh, connected to this church is 1418, when it was announced um, an architectural design competition to build the dome. So until this moment, the church had this humongous hole because they, uh, they nobody could come up with the, with the solution to cover um, the dome, to, to build the dome of the church. Uh, so again, Ghiberti and Brunelleschi uh, participate to this big competition, and this time Brunelleschi won. Uh, and um, uh, at, the, at that time, Brunelleschi was also very supported by Cosimo de' Medici. Um, so why the church is called Santa Maria del Fiore? The ancient church was called Santa Reparata. So they changed the name probably uh, because uh, of the Florentine iris, uh, because the iris, the flower, is the symbol of the city. And then the church is dedicated uh, to, uh, to the Virgin Mary. So that's why uh, the name Santa Maria del Fiore. Um, the cathedral, as I mentioned, is built in, on Gothic style with these polychrome marbles that are beautiful. They're like colors from uh, green to red um, and white. All marbles coming from the area of Carrara, which is uh, in Tuscany. These marbles uh, repeat or the already existing uh, bands on the walls of the earliest Battistero and the Giotto's Tower as well. The facade, uh, the original facade was begun by Giotto, but was then the collective work of several artists like Andrea Orcagna and Taddeo Gatti. The original facade, unfortunately, was dismantled completely in 1587 by Bernardo Buontalenti and was redone completely. Um, and the actual facade that you see today uh, was completed in 1887 and it mimics, again, the Tuscan Romanesque style of the uh, build, building uh, next to it. Uh, the church uh, also has three uh, bronze doors that are dated later, uh, the end of the 19th century, and they tell stories uh, of the life of the Virgin Mary. Uh, on top of the facade, we see statues of the 12 apostles within the middle, the Madonna with child. The, the interior of this church is uh, pretty empty, uh, the Gothic style emptiness correspond with austerity of the religious life and that's why it's pretty empty of decorations. Uh, many decorations got also lost or moved inside museum later. The cathedral is built as a Roman basilica with the wide central nave and the base forming what is called a Latin cross. Uh, the church measures about 90,000 square feet, so it's really big, and it's still today one of the largest uh, in Italy. Um, this church uh, has beautiful stained glass, uh, 44 windows, which are the works of the, uh, some of the greatest Florentine artists of their time, such as Donatello, Ghiberti, and Paolo Cello. And in the church, you can also see uh, the crypt uh, that you see in the, in the bottom right corner of this slide, uh, which is the original uh, Santa Reparata structure that, that is dated back to the fifth century. The church has also beautiful mosaic pavements with geometrical patterns. There is a, a clock. The clock is the, in this slide on the uh, right upper corner. Uh, that was designed in 1443 by Paolo Uccello, is a fresco, and in accordance with the Ora Italica, where the 24 hour of, hours of the day uh, was, was at sunset. So uh, it's a beautiful clock. Um, the frescoes in the dome are by Giorgio Vasari. 
uh, they're dated 1572, 79, and tell the story of the last judgment. We know that Brunelleschi wanted uh, the dome to be uh, decorated with, uh, with uh, mosaics, but then uh, that, that never happened. Um, let's see, let me check the time. Okay, I think I'm going to stop right here because next time I want to see with you. Uh, so I'm going to show you briefly a video of everything we talk about now. And then next time we're going to see the cupola. Next time we're going to see the, the dome. And we're going to see how Brunelleschi, who didn't have any formal training as an architect or an engineer, was able to build the dome. So if you have any question, please. Um, I put a question in the chat about um, Palm Sunday. Yes, just a second. I can. I need to stop sharing something is not working. I can read it to you if you want. Yes, please. Okay. So when we were in um, in Italy on Palm Sunday, um, there were two things going on. One was they were having a fishing contest on the Arno, and we wondered um, if that was an annual event. Is it something that they do every year that you know of? Interesting. I didn't know anything about that. Um, we were teasing each other because we said, when we go back to the hotel, don't eat the fish. <laughs> because it's, it's not the cleanest river in the world. Oh, I would never eat a fish from the river, honestly. <laughs> they told us that it was a contest and it was an annual event. But also we went to church for Palm Sunday and they didn't distribute palms, they distributed olive branches. Yes. Yes, that's exactly what we do in Italy. It's, it's the symbol of peace. So that's, uh, that's uh, a tradition in Italy. You, you do it on, on, um, on the Sunday before Easter, yeah. So I wonder how it became palm in the United States if Italy, you know, does the uh, olive brand. Very good question, yeah. yeah. I don't know, Any, anybody knows? I have to look it up. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. I can I can stop yeah. sharing for some reason. Uh, something is not working. About it. it's good. I have a question. Yes, I have a question. Yes. Um, are you going to discuss the southeast area where the heel is, the Apulia section? So I'm not going to do that in this, in, during this class, uh, but hopefully if Michelle is okay with that, I can do another uh, session in the winter where I'm going to do the south of Italy. Okay, great. So next time we're going to do Florence again, and then we're going to do Rome. Uh, Benedetta, yes. what did they do with all of that mud? Where was, what happened to it? I, I have no idea. Probably they brought the mud somewhere in the countryside, I guess. Um, I don't, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. It was, like, it was like a disaster, a complete disaster. But I think they were bringing the mud somewhere with like huge trucks, probably um, like far away from the city. Benedetta? Yes. Uh, I remember that flood very well because the frescoes were removed and brought to the Metropolitan Museum of Art oh, see. on display while the walls were dried and, and prepared for the return of the frescoes. Oh, that's so interesting, Rita. Yeah. Yeah, and as I mentioned to you, the technique to, to detach the frescoes from yeah. the wall was invented uh, because of, of the emergency. So they had to come up with these very original ways uh, to yeah. save what they could at that time. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and back to the palms. Yes. Palm Sunday originally would have been in Israel. Jerusalem. Well, you have palm trees. Yeah. Although you do have olive trees also, but you have palm trees. Because that it's when Jesus entered in Jerusalem. Right. Yeah. Right. 
but I'm not sure why in Italy is um, the olive the, the olive tree, um, which is the symbol of peace. Yes, and there are olive trees in Italy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think originally in Italy they they just use they replaced the palm. This is Sharon. They replaced, they did use palms and then they replaced it because it was the symbol of peace. The palm was the symbol of victory and goodness. So I think that's, they used the olive as, but to symbolize peace, like you said, they just replaced it. Has the number of residents gone down in Florence like it did in Venice? Not really. No, um, I mean, life in Florence is always pretty much the same. There's a, there's a big number of tourists, of course, but you know, it's like bigger than, than, than Venice. So the situation, it's a little bit different. Um, so no, it's pretty much, uh, this is growing probably, uh, if you consider the countryside and, 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 and everything, uh, definitely. No, it's not the case in Florence. Okay. When they built that tower, why did they have to make it different widths to make it look equal? Why didn't they just build it equally? I there, there was like you mean, you mean the trick that they built like level to look yeah. at? Yeah, um, it was just you know a trick that to to trick the eye. Uh, there was something that, that they were doing during Renaissance, applying these mathematical rules, so they the the tower was like, it looked like bigger in, in, in all his, in his height. If you look at the tower from the bottom, it was just a trick that they decide to apply. One more question. Why did they change the capital from Florence to Rome? Well, probably because then uh, the the government was uh, the the govern the building of the government were were all in Rome, and so they decided to uh, to move it to to Rome for the for that reason, and, and because of the history of, of Rome itself. Uh, so first it was in Turin, then in Florence, and then in Rome. Thank you. So there's, if there's no other questions, I think we can, we can say goodbye and I'll see you all next Monday. We're going to do the second part of Florence. All right. It was good to see you. Thank you, Thank you. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.